Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another Gun Store vlog where today we're going to be talking about the 2022 assault weapons ban and how it might differ from the 1994 assault weapons ban. If that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. In 1994, a law was passed under President Bill Clinton known by many people as the Assault Weapons Ban of 1994. This aimed to reduce the amount of so-called assault weapons in private hands and in civilian circulation in the United States, and it would aim to do this by attacking certain features found on most rifles such as adjustable stocks, pistol grips, bayonet lugs, and threaded muzzles. Now this would sunset in 2004 and no longer exists. However, lately in 2022, a new version of the Assault Weapons Ban was recently passed the House under Nancy Pelosi. Now, I personally don't believe that this has a chance of passing, especially with the filibuster in the Senate. And even if it does go to the president's desk for a signature, I don't believe it'll hold up in the Supreme Court as there is a conservative majority in the courts currently, and they have shown recently time and time again what their typical position is when it comes to Second Amendment cases. Now, with that being said, I believe that there is a difference between why the 1994 bill passed and why this one likely won't. And I want to talk about the evolution of what has happened societally and why I believe that is going to be the case. Now, if we go back in time and sort of address what an assault weapon is, at least a civilian version of an assault weapon, and how that evolved into United States ownership and commerce in this country, and how I believe the public perception of that has changed over the years. Now, if we go back in time to the 1960s, the United States would adopt the M16 and M16A1 into military service. This is during the Vietnam War, chambered in the 556 NATO. Now, at the same time, Colt would make a civilian version called the SP-1. It was a semi-automatic version of the M16 for all intents and purposes. It did not land too well on the U.S. commercial market, mainly because there was a lot of fatigue with what was happening in the Vietnam War. You had a lot of people back home who were not so happy about what was happening overseas, and of course you had soldiers returning home who wanted nothing to do with the things that looked like the battle implements they had been using. In fact, Colt even went from the, the 556 NATO to the 223 Remington ammunition designation marked on the receiver as it made the firearm appeal more to a sporting market, which is what was really common in the United States in the 60s and 70s. The rifle, as really the only AR-15 option in the United States, would see limited success through the 60s and 70s, but it wasn't until the 80s when there became a growing demand for these types of firearms here locally in the U.S. Simultaneously, you start seeing demand for things like the AK pattern, and AKs start coming in from Mahdi and Egypt, uh, brought in by Steyr. You have things like the Valmet rifles from Finland, and even the Norinco and Polytech AKs from China. Now, from about 1985 to 1989, those were coming in in limited numbers, and they were starting to see some growing popularity on the U.S. consumer market, although a lot of people in the firearms community still relegated those as somewhat fringe type of paramilitary equipment, still not really adopted in full by the gun-owning community. Even the NRA has some apprehension about the ownership of these types of firearms. Now in 1989, there was an event called the Stockton Schoolyard Shooting, where a maniac took a Norinco AK and shot at a playground with children on it in Stockton, California. This led to then President Bush Sr. enacting an importation restriction on those types of firearms that could be imported into the United States and they needed to have a sporting clause. Now the sporting clause meant that these things coming in had to have limited features like thumbhole stocks, non-threaded muzzles, no bayonet lugs, similar to the 1994 ban. As a result, we see that there was a very limited amount of time that these things actually had to build up any type of meaningful supply in gun stores, gun shows, and in the gun community's hands. And there was not a lot of time for their the perception of those sorts of items to change from military implements from overseas to something that's adaptable to a modern uh, civilian population used for sporting recreational purposes or for defense of land, home, and country. Furthermore, if we look at the AR-15 market simultaneously, there are still limited producers of those here. There's Colt and Bushmaster, and that's really about it. And most AR-15s are still priced well over $1,000, which limits a lot of people out of their market. Now, in 1992, President Bill Clinton would win the presidential election. Along with that, the Democrats would take the House and the Senate. A couple years later, Bill Clinton would look at enacting the 1994 assault weapons ban. The landscape at the time, remember, is it is a full democratic house and Senate and presidency. We're talking about banning things that are not in wide circulation are and are somewhat unobtainable for a lot of people due to their price. 
and something that had really only been around for about a decade. Of course, it would pass, but with a sunset provision, which would allow it to expire 10 years later if it were not reinstated. Now, as society begins to evolve, you have an interest in what is, is being banned. And actually, a lot of people believe brought a lot of attention to those types of firearms. And that was irrefutable based on all the manufacturers that cropped up in the United States and importers that cropped up in the United States in the 1990s. The 1990s was one of the biggest booms in, in terms of gun owning and gun ownership. And is also unfortunately when we start seeing this problem with shootings happening in society, which most prominent would be in 1999 during the assault weapons ban at Columbine High School. Now in 2004, the assault weapons ban would sunset and with that it would unleash the floodgates. You would have PTR Industries, you would have um, all sorts of different manufacturers coming out with now non-ban compliant firearms. The pre-ban, we so-called Colt AR-15s are starting to raise in popularity, and Colt is even coming out with variants of the LE-6920, the modern era of AR-15, which now has all the features and sales would start to boom through the 2000s. Now through the late 2000s, getting onto this tidal wave, you have uh, Delton, you have uh, Palmetto State Armory coming a little bit later with all the AK variants you have. Uh, even during the assault weapons ban, uh, Century Arms bringing in Romanian AKs as well. Uh, AKs coming in from Bulgaria. There is this massive flood of all these types of firearms and now the ownership of this type of stuff is soaring. You get through the 2010s, again with PSA, you have Aero Precision and Spikes Tactical with build kits, Bear Creek Arsenal. So you have everybody not only making affordable AR-15s and AKs, but people are making build kits. There's the social media is coming along with the proliferation of the spreading of this knowledge of how to build these firearms yourself at home and the gun owning community starts to explode. Not only that, the perception of the of how okay it is to own these sorts of things. Remember, AR-15s in the 1970s to 1980s went from this sort of, you're a paramilitary wacko if you own one, and that was inside the gun community too. If you don't have one, you're not a gun owner <laughs> or you don't believe in liberty. So the idea or the fundamental opinion of those types of firearms has shifted. So in 2010s, I believe we start to see the evolution of the angst towards these firearms. Unfortunately, they're starting to be used more and more in mass shooting events which is causing people who are not gun owners to start becoming a little, a little bit more politically aware and politically motivated as an opposition force against their ownership. Now this started to grow very, very wide in the 2010 to 2012 period, which is about the time that I personally was getting into firearms. Now, I opened my store in uh, 2014, but I remember very clearly the first big panic I saw as a result of political fallout. And that would happen in 2012 when then President Obama would stand up and address the nation with his desire to ban uh, so-called assault weapons related magazines and ammunition as a result of the horrible atrocities that ha happened at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School. Now that led into a big panic purchase. There's, in fact, was no assault weapons ban that actually even passed the House or the Senate. But that's still just by the mere consequence of President Obama talking about it, led to an ultimate tidal wave of purchasing. It led to lack of availability of AR-15 related ammunition and even 22 LR. And this would go all the way until about 2015, a year after I opened my doors. And I remember my first year of operations, we were still dealing with limited availability of those items. Now, as time would go on from 2015 to about 2016, 2017, it started becoming very predictable to me that any time there was a shooting or any time there was even a minor political blip in terms of the attack on Second Amendment rights that would ultimately leave into, lead into people flooding gun stores to buy ammunition and things that they were sure were going to be banned. Now, through 2016 to 2020, that would slow down because President Trump was in office and he ran on a pro-gun platform and vowed that he would not attack the Second Amendment. Now that ultimately ended up not being true in all cases, but what was true is there was no political grandstanding as a result of things happening like shootings or other related events. And that also predictably led to a slowdown of purchasing when those events would happen. Now, 2020 to 2022, the next big thing happens and this is the next wave of new gun ownership. You have COVID and then you have all the civil and social unrest happening around the riots and the looting that's happening in a lot of urban cities. You have people who live in those areas who are starting to realize that they can't depend on their local law enforcement departments to take care of them. So you have this growing of several million new people into the ranks of firearm ownership and firearm ownership and the belief in the Second Amendment is starting to spread like wildfire. In fact, around that time, I had made a couple videos addressing the very question is, is anti-gun politics or is firearm politics at all a losing issue moving forward? And I think it is.
Now that leads us to a head of what's happening in 2022 with the introduction of the so-called assault weapons ban in the House. I believe that this is just political theater and it's pandering to the Democratic base or the anti-gun base leading into the next election term. Again, I don't think this has a chance of passing. So if we look at the impact of what it could have on both Democrats and Republicans voting on such an act, it is likely not going to favor well with Republicans. It will not likely not favor well with moderates and it would really only land well with more extreme Democrats, which by the mere virtue of putting it through the House would gain their support. But if it were to actually be passed and go into practice, then a lot of voters would see how that would actually affect their lives and would give them a little bit of angst and animosity towards the people who helped pass it. Now, if we go back to 2000, I'm sorry, if we go back to 1996, two years after the passing of the assault weapons ban, there was what was known as the Republican Revolution. Republicans, for the first time since the 1950s, took complete house of, or complete control of the House and the Senate and government. And that could have been a reaction to what happened in 1994. I know that was multifaceted and had a lot of different reasons for why that happened. But something similar could happen if the 2022 assault weapons ban were to pass, which is why I don't believe it was actually intended to pass. I believe it was just used as a political token. It's serving its purpose now and will likely fizzle out and die in the next stages of its life. Anyway, guys, that is all I have for you today on this. If you have any questions, please let me know down in the comment section. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.